Okay, it's time, let's start. Uh, thank you for joining. I'm uh, Roma from OVH. Uh, I've been working uh, at OVH for the last three years on uh, our Swift uh, products. So today I'm going to share with you uh, our experience uh, about uh, migrating uh, large clusters from uh, replica policy to error recording policy. Um, first of all, just uh, an indication of uh, what we do with Swift. Um, we uh, launched in December 2011 uh, uh, an offer for the general public called Ubic. It's a cloud, it's a cloud storage solution uh, with some application for mobile and desktop and also a web interface. At that time, is, uh, it was not uh, running on Swift and we quickly found out it uh, will not scale enough. So one year later, we uh, migrated all the data to Swift. Um, since then, it has been running uh, smoothly. Um, one year ago, we launched a public cloud offer. Uh, so there will all the instance part based on Nova and, and Neutron and all that stuff. And also, of course, an object storage based on Swift. Um, it works fine, as always with Swift. Um, and uh, six months ago, uh, we decided uh, to convert our uh, Yabic uh, clusters to uh, errors recording. So to give you a few numbers to show you how good it works, um, we have, oh, so you will see there is a plus sign in front of every number. Uh, it's just because it's growing so fast that I almost lost track uh, of the numbers. So we have between 25 and 30 petabytes of user data, uh, more than 10 billions of objects and we have quite a lot of devices, between 25,000 and 30,000. So before going into the details of uh, the conversion of the objects, uh, I'm gonna show you quickly the difference between replication and error recording. Um, in a replication policy, each object will be written many times uh, in your cluster. So in this example, uh, we have a replication factor of three, so every time you upload an object, it will be written three times on the cluster, hopefully on three different servers, maybe three different zones if you have them. Um, this replication factor um, is the durability of the object. If we lose, in this example, two devices, the object is still available. Uh, so the more replication you have, the more durable is the object. Um, also, it's, uh, it's having multiple uh, re uh, replica uh, is you to uh, scale uh, your download bandwidth because you will be able to access all the replica of the object in parallel. Um, so it can help you to, to propose something like a CDN, for example, because you will be able to scale horizontally uh, your bandwidth. Um, the, the drawback of a replication policy is that it's written many times in the cluster, so this is the overhead. In these times, if the user uploads six bytes, 18 bytes are written on, the, on your cluster. So this is an overhead of three, like the replication factor. Um, on your cluster, each object, each replica, uh, will be stored in a file. So I show you an example uh, of the path on top. Um, there is two important information in the path of your file, this is the hash. The hash is a computation of the object URL. Um, partition and suffix that you can see right before the hash are extracted from the hash itself. And the second information that is very important is the timestamp. The timestamp is the date the object was uploaded to the cluster. So it is set by the proxy during the upload. The user cannot set it. And it's a very important information because all the eventual consistency model of Swift is based on it. If for any reason you end up having different version of your object in your cluster, maybe if you have a network split or something like that, Swift will use this timestamp to choose the good version of the object. This will be the last one, actually. Erase the coding is a bit different. Uh, as your object will not be written many times in the cluster, but it will be split in different fragments. Uh, and some fragments of parity will be added. So uh, in this example, my object, 
uh, which is still six bytes, will be split into three fragments of data, and one fragment of parity will be added. added. So, um, uh, sorry. Uh, so this means that you can control the overhead of uh, of your uh, of your policy, unlike replication factor when you set a replication factor of three, you have an overhead of three. Here, we only have an overhead of 1.3. But the durability is not very good with this configuration, because if we lose two devices, the object is not available anymore. But with a error coding, you can choose a number. You can, for example, have 10 fragments of data and two fragments of parity. This gives you an overhead of 1.2, but this will give you a better durability almost the same than with a replica, with three replica, because if you lose two uh, fragments, you can still access your object. Uh, so th this looks good. Uh, I mean, you can control uh, the durability, you can control the overhead. Now it's not perfect, because every time you will access your object, uh, you have to fetch all uh, fragments to rebuild the object. So you will not be able to scale as you can do with replica. Uh, you cannot have many uh, parallel downloads of the object. Uh, also, um, all the computation of uh, fragmenting uh, the object and calculating parity fragment is done on the proxy. So there is some extra CPU consumption on the proxy. It's not a lot, but still it exists. So you have to take this uh, into account when you prepare your infrastructure. Um, if you look at the path, it's the same on the disk. Uh, each fragment is stored in a file. Uh, the only difference is there is a new information at the end, which is a fragment number, because the object is split in a certain way on the proxy. So when you fetch all the fragment to rebuild the object, you have to regroup them in the same order than they were split. Um, as we just saw, uh, each fragment are unique in the cluster. Uh, for, so when you, when you lose uh, a device with replica policy, you can just copy another, uh, another version of the object to the device you just replaced, for example. You cannot do that with uh, error coding because each fragment are unique. So you cannot just copy one fragment uh, in place of another. So you have to rebuild uh, the missing fragment. This is why you cannot use AirSync anymore uh, with errors recording. Uh, this is why there is a new protocol in Swift. Well, new. It has been uh, around uh, for a few times, but it's called S-Sync. And this is a protocol that is used uh, with errors recording. So instead of having object re replicator for replica, we ha now have the object reconstructor. The object reconstructor does two kind of jobs. First one is a revert job. This is moving uh, data to their correct uh, device. For example, if you just did a rebalance, this is a reconstructor that will do a reverse job to move the fragment where they should be. And the second job is the sync job. It's rebuilding the missing fragments. So now that everybody is a Rosal coding expert in the room, I think we can uh, do some conversion. Let's see how we do that. First of all, uh, what was our requirement to convert our cluster to a browser coding? First one, it must be transparent to our user. Ubic is a general public uh, solution, so our customers are not API experts, storage policy experts. Uh, they don't know what is uh, a browser coding, and they don't want to know. So it must be transparent to them. They must not notice uh, that we are changing uh, the storage policy. Uh, Second uh, requirement, uh, the conversion must uh, happen in place. Uh, we are uh, moving to a res recording, uh, let's be honest, is for cost reason, to reduce our cost. So if we had to spawn a new cluster with petabytes of capacity just to copy the data and then having an empty cluster uh, on the other side, it would be a loss of money. So we want the conversion to happen inside of the same cluster. And last uh, but not least, it must be scalable. The conversion must scale because we have petabytes of data, we have billions of objects, and we don't want to wait a few years uh, to see the end of this process. Actually, a few months uh, 
look like a nice target. Uh, replica or error recording are just storage policy in Swift. So um, a storage policy is an object feature, but it is declared on the container level. So when we will uh, convert uh, the object from replica to uh, error recording, we must take care of keeping this information in sync. Um, the easy part, uh, that was the first step, was just to declare this new error recording policy, setting it as a default in Swift. Uh, so all new customer will be automatically in uh, error recording. So this is really the easy part and just a few lines of configuration. And after that, we had to uh, convert the whole customer to error recording. As I just said, uh, information uh, of the storage policy is declared inside the container. So we must take care of updating container also while converting the object. There is no API to, uh, as of today, there is no API to convert uh, a container to change its storage policy. So basically, it's like running some uh, SQL query against the SQLite database of the container. Uh, so I give you this uh, small example of queries. Um, there is some more precaution around, but it ends up being just two updates in the database. Uh, of course, uh, you have to run them on all replica of your container. And also to avoid uh, the Swift process like auditor and replicator, stuff like that, uh, messing around while you're updating your database, uh, you have to disable them. Um, one last thing with uh, this kind of modification is uh, maybe you know the container are updated by the object server. When you upload an object, it's the object server that will update the container. So we have to take care that if an upload is started before uh, we run this update command, uh, the object server will not uh, insert the object with the old uh, storage policy. So we added a few, uh, few lines of code to handle this case also. Uh, basically, just uh, comparing the incoming uh, update to the container with the storage policy declared in the container, and if it doesn't match, uh, fix it on the fly. Um, so once we did that, um, Swift will think that our objects are in error the code, but they are not. They're still in the replication policy. So because we cannot convert of the object in instantaneously, we have to uh, maintain the access to the whole data. So this, um, to maintain this access, this access to the whole data in the replica policy, uh, we will handle this at the proxy level. So when your user will uh, try to download uh, the object he, he uploaded a few days or a few months ago, the proxy will try to reach uh, the data on the object server on the error recording policy. If the object has not been yet converted, the object policy, uh, the object server will just tell, sorry, I don't have this file here. So it will return uh, an HTTP code of 404. So the proxy will catch this error and just rerun the request on the replication policy. It translates very easily into code. So this is the only line of code you will see in this uh, presentation. Uh, Basically, third line, you run the normal request, and if it fails, you have the condition under. If it's a 404, let's run it uh, with the replication policy. There is some more condition to handle a few corner cases, but this is 90% of, uh, of the code, actually. Um, so um, what, what I just show you uh, is the example of the get. But it's the same logic for the, for the delayed or for the post to modify uh, some uh, metadata. Uh, last thing, so now that we handled the transparent part of our requirement, um, let's see how we can make it scale. Uh, the idea is to run it where the scaling happens in Swift. If we look at the numbers on Ubic, we have like 20 to 30 proxy like 50 account on container servers, and about 5,000 object servers. 
So it's clear, just looking at the number, that the scaling in Swift happens on the object server. Um, if you're running uh, some uh, Swift cluster uh, at a large scale, um, you may have uh, some uh, scaling issues with the object explorer or container sync. I'm actually deeply convinced that if they were running more closer to the object server, uh, we wouldn't have this kind of issues. So the community is working on, uh, on it, so hopefully it will be fixed uh, one way or another. Uh, but my point is scaling is in the object server, so this is where we will run the process that convert the object from replica to a browser coding. Uh, one problem with running this process on the object server is that the object server has no idea of what are the object it is storing, what are the objects on this device. So to handle that, actually it's quite simple. We scan the device and we create a map uh, to map the account and container to the hash of the object. So if you remember at the beginning of the presentation, the hash is the computation of the account, container, and objects of the URL. So it's unique. And with, this, with just this information, you can rebuild all the paths uh, of the object on the device. So we just create a database mapping the container to the hash. Um, once we, so we run it uh, during the night because most of our customers are Europeans, so we have low traffic uh, during the night and a scanning device can consume some I.O. So, um, once uh, we did that, we have the mapping. So if we decide to convert uh, a container, uh, we can quickly find uh, all the objects we have on the devices of the object server just by looking at this database. So we can quickly convert a container to, uh, to a browser coding. Uh, conversion will happen uh, between object servers themselves uh, because we run the process on the object server. And to do that, we use uh, a class in the Swift code that is called the internal client. It, it makes your process act like a Swift proxy with uh, the pipeline and almost all the stuff. Um, but you don't need all the feature you usually have on your proxy, so you don't have to put a Celometra middleware or the authentication middleware, SLO, DLO. You don't have to, to write them in your configuration. You can keep it to, to the minimum. Um, so we use this class to run on the object server, and it will act like a Swift proxy. So you will do an upload with this class, and like a Swift proxy, it will write on the object server that should handle uh, this object. So for, uh, this is the example of an object in a replica on the left. The process will act like the Swift proxy and write it on uh, all the object server that are supposed to handle uh, this object in errors coding. So this is what happens when you convert one object, but we don't work by object, we work by container. So when we launch the conversion of a container, there is many objects. If it's a big container, there is at least one object on each device. Uh, so it ends up being something like that. Every object server converts in every way to the others. Um, this is what makes it very fast, actually, uh, because all objects get converted uh, all together. So except if you have uh, billions uh, of objects in your container, which I guess doesn't work uh, quite uh, right in Swift, you don't have many problems. So at that point, we have, uh, we have a working solution. And you may say, actually we did, what could possibly go wrong? Well, few things, let's be honest. Uh, first one, um, I talked to you how we uh, maintain uh, access to the data that are not yet converted, and I told you it was for get, post, and delete. Uh, the head request is a bit different from the other because it doesn't access all the fragments at the same time. So uh, because it's optimized, it only gets to get one fragment 
to um, uh, to return the information to the customer, the metadata. So the proxy just try to reach uh, the first object server, and if it don't get the information, it will try the second one, third, fourth, fifth one, etc. Until it runs out of primary nodes, then it will try on the end of nodes, 15 more, and so it makes 30 requests, and during that uh, that time the user is waiting, or maybe is not waiting anymore, uh, because it can take a lot of time. Uh, and after uh, 30 requests, uh, the proxy gives up, and then our code uh, try to fall back to replica. Uh, to handle that, we just limited the number of tries uh, the proxy will do. Uh, so we chose five tries uh, because we, we think it's a good compromise. Because if the proxy don't find any fragments in the first five tries, I mean, we have a big problem, very big. So just answering a head request uh, won't be uh, our main concern. Um, this is just because we don't have that much dispersion in our cluster. So this was the first problem our user uh, uh, told us. They had some latency uh, for the head request. Uh, second problem, um, when you start the conversion of a container, especially if it's a big container, all the object server will start to convert all together. And as they act like a proxy, they will do some requests to check that the account exists, uh, that the container exists, some kind of head request. And when you have a 20,000 process uh, reaching to the same container server, uh, it hurts. It hurts the container server. So um, it's pretty easy. Just uh, using the cache middleware uh, on the pipeline of the commercial uh, process. Uh, and uh, just adding that, using memcache, uh, 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 fix this load problem on the account and container server. And also, we added um, a distributed mutex uh, to the solution uh, to control the number of parallel conversion because um, converting too much object at the same time was creating uh, a lot of high ops on the cluster. So controlling a bit uh, the number of uh, conversion uh, helped us to handle this extra load. Um, third problem, uh, this one, Hopefully, we handled it before uh, our customers saw it. Uh, the, the arrow in the middle is a timeline. So let's say you have your object uh, in replica that was uploaded with timestamp one. Uh, if before the conversion, uh, your user upload a new version of the object, it will be uploaded in error recording. So you will have two versions of your object, one in replica, and the new one with timestamp two in error recording policy. But your user delayed uh, this object very quickly, so you end up with a timestamp file, uh, which has the timestamp three, and at some point the, time, the timestamp will get reclaimed. So by default, uh, I think it's one week uh, in the Swift cluster. So if your object was not converted within one week after uh, your user uh, deleted the new version of the object, the, the process, the cluster, will have, will have no way to know that there were a new version in error the coding. And so when the conversion will happen, it will recreate an object based on the old version of the object you, the user had a long time ago. So it can be a bit disturbing for customers to see all version of the object reappearing uh, in their folder or in their, uh, in their account. So it's not very uh, complicated to handle. You just have to be sure conversion happens uh, in less than reclaim age that you wrote into your configuration. So the default is one week. Conversion of container is quite fast, so you should not uh, it as this case, but if you put a reclaim age to, I don't know, a few hours, maybe it's a risk. Uh, last one, uh, I told you we were scanning devices to build a mapping uh, uh, between container and uh, object hash. Uh, the, the problem with that is, first, it's IO intensive. So just scanning all the device 
every night. Uh, it's a lot of uh, listed here. This is a Python call. Uh, every file must be opened to read the extended attribute to get the account and container. So it's very IO intensive. And you have to do it every day because every day you have new upload, new delete. If you do rebalance, a lot of data move between devices. So it really must be done every day. Uh, the, the solution, it's not implemented quite yet, but we are working on it's update the database in real time. Uh, we first thought of using a feature of the kernel, which is called eBPF. Um, it's in the recent kernel. It allows the process to hook uh, to some function of the kernel. Uh, the one we were interesting uh, was uh, VFS create, unlink, and rename. So with these three uh, functions, you can follow the life of a file on, uh, on every device. Uh, problem with this solution is that it was uh, asynchronous. So the database was some time late on the reality of the file system. And also, uh, it, um, if we miss some events from the kernel, the database was completely out of sync. So uh, we are uh, working on extending the disk file class in Swift um, to update the database in real time for each uh, creation of object or deletion of object. Uh, problem with working with this file is that only Swift uh, can know about uh, the, the, the update in the file system. So if you're, for example, using AirSync to, uh, to uh, rebalance your cluster, uh, your database will be out of sync. Uh, so just use a sync. Uh, actually, we have very good experience with it. Uh, even for replication, it's better than AirSync. So we moved uh, completely away from AirSync. And of course, uh, don't go uh, uh, deleting file by hand on your devices. Don't mess with your files. Swift does it. Uh, it handles everything. I, I really like um, to having th this database up to date in real time always uh, on my object server because it, it opens some, uh, some possibilities. Uh, for example, uh, you can map more than just account and container. You, you can map uh, the Xperia header so you can delete your object locally faster. You can store uh, like the A time on your file system, the last access to your object. So you can, uh, you can take some tiering decision based on it. Uh, you can also map uh, some inode information so that it, it will allow you to access your file faster than just accessing it the standard way of the file system. And if you index everything, you could also avoid doing uh, the list dir uh, call, which is used a lot by replicator, reconstructor, auditor, and which consume a lot of IO on, uh, on devices. So, Having this database um, open interesting possibilities, and uh, well, we are we are working uh, with that uh, at OVH. So, what is the current situation? Uh, we had about 26 petabytes to convert. Uh, we started in March, and from March to August, we converted about half of our cluster. Not all the conversion was done uh, with our uh, process because uh, we had some help from the official Yubik application that instead of uh, overriding existing object, always delayed the whole version to upload a new version of, uh, of a customer file. So it helped us a lot uh, also. We paused this conversion because we are having some uh, scaling issues uh, related to error recording and file system. So this is stuff we are working on uh, to, f to start uh, to end the conversion uh, as soon as we can. Um, so this is, a, this is a good time to, to give some feedbacks uh, on errors recording. Um, first of all, if you're wondering about bandwidth, it's, it's pretty good. You, you won't see a lot of differences uh, with the replica, uh, except if you try to access the same object uh, a lot well, then, if you have a lot of parallel download on the same object, um, you can have some, uh, you will have better performance with a replica. But for a normal use, a general public use like we do with Ubic, it's no problem. Uh, the extra load uh, on CPU, on the proxy, is very, very low. Actually, we didn't see the difference. 
so it's very low. Uh, but you have a small increased latency uh, to access your object. Uh, it's linked to the way uh, error zircoding works because there is a buffer on the proxy that must be filled before sending the information to the customer. So you have some increased latency. Uh, so it depends on your use case, I guess. Uh, rebalance. If you're running a big error zircoding cluster, uh, rebalance have a very huge impact on performance. Uh, so you must really run it during low traffic, uh, at night if you can, and doing small steps. So it will take longer time to add your devices uh, to your cluster. So you should anticipate more uh, when, you are, when you are adding devices. Um, I will skip uh, the reason. There is some discussion on that. Uh, Another, um, another feedback on error zircoding is that you will have uh, more files on your cluster because instead of having, in our case, three data files per object, we are now having 15 data files and 15 durable files. Well, the durable files uh, will disappear soon because uh, some, uh, some patch uh, landed uh, in the Git uh, recently, but still uh, you have more files uh, and each file uh, consumes one inode. Uh, actually, if, you have, if we are syncing uh, with fragment, each fragment will consume two inodes, one for the data file, one for the directory. Uh, so you will end up with a lot more inode on your disk. And in our case, at uh, half of the conversion, on a six terabyte disk, disk we have about 43 million of inode. One inode is one kilobyte. So it's uh, uh, 43 gigabytes of inode per devices. So it can fit in memory, of course, except if you dedicated uh, 64 gigabytes of memory for one disk, but I doubt it. Uh, in our situation, it means that we have about 85% uh, of cache miss on the inode. So a lot of access uh, to, to the disk is done just to read the inode, not to read the data. So it's a, it's a loss of time, I would say. Um, another interesting number, uh, if we're looking at low level on the file system, is I was talking about the list deer. Uh, list deer is actually a read deer, which translates to a get the entries, uh, syscall. And about uh, 75 uh, of this uh, get the entries uh, doesn't come from the cache. It means that every time you read a directory, if you're doing a list deer or just trying to go through a, through a hierarchy of path, uh, half of them will, uh, will come from the disk and not from the memory. So it's a lot of uh, lost IOPS. Um, last, it's not really a feedback, it's more like a tip if you, if you will run a res recording. Uh, when you configure your policy, you have a, a configuration parameter called EC object segment size. It's actually the size of the buffer uh, for a browser coding to work on. Uh, you have another parameter, which is not related at all, which is called the client timeout, which is the time the object server will wait for data coming from the proxy. So when your customer uploads an object to your proxy, it will not be sent directly to the object server, but it will be in the buffer of the proxy. But the proxy already opened a connection to the object server. And if your user is uploading really slowly, uh, you will hit the timeout before the buffer is filled. So we, it took some, <laughs> some hours to, to understand that. So you have to configure these two parameters. Uh, it it depends on your user bandwidth. So in our case, as we already had uh, uh, errors recording running, uh, we couldn't change the uh, segment size. We increased the client timeouts. Uh, all this work, uh, we didn't do it all by ourselves. Uh, there is a review in progress on uh, changing the storage policy of a container, and we took a lot of code from there. So hopefully we'll get merged one day, I hope. It's very interesting for operators. And before ending, uh, if, you, if you liked what we are doing with Swift, you can join us. We are recruiting, really. So come talk to me or find me on IRC. 
uh, if you want to have fun with Swift, uh, we, had, uh, we have a lot of things to do. I think we have five minutes for questions. So if you have some, uh, feel free, there is a, a micro there. Thank you. What do you guys use for the distributed mutex? Uh, actually, actually we, uh, we took a solution based on Rabbit. It's, uh, it looks strange, but it's, uh, it works uh, efficiently, and it's very simple. So I like when it's simple. Uh, what do you guys ended up running for your reclaim age? We're, we're going through a process. We're, we're inc increasing the default uh, one week reclaim age on a lot of our clusters. We're thinking that a little bit longer is better. I meant to ask Brian the same question. What did you guys settle on? Are you still doing a week? Yeah, we're still doing a week. Uh, and we don't really want to increase it because it will increase the number of files on devices. So one week is good for us. Uh, maybe I misunderstood, but uh, from what I got, from what you said, basically you are uh, starting, when you start to migrate your objects, you start from an index that you build scrapping your nodes, right? Your storage nodes. Okay, so since you have the object in Replica at three places, uh, how do you handle not uh, starting the, the migration three times over? What? Because you want to migrate once. So. Sure. Uh, actually, it wouldn't be a problem, but we run the conversion on only one zone. Okay. So yeah. we have okay. three zones, so yeah. it works okay. that way. Makes sense. Thank you. Okay. I think we're good. Thank you.